Okay, thank you very much. So I'm happy to be here and share some of my research with you, and I'm happy that you're here. I understand that um, we're competing tonight with astronaut Scott Kelly up on main campus. Um, so thanks for coming and, and um, thinking that this is more important than that. Uh, <laughs> there, there might still be time to make it up there if you change your mind. Um, so <clears throat> just a show of hands, how many people think there's a dark side of the moon? How many don't? I'm not going to define it yet on purpose. Okay, so we're, we're split about 50-50. So um, we were listening to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which popularized this idea that the moon has a dark side, uh, presumably that remains in shadow all the time. And um, if you listen to that album, there's a, a person saying at some point during one of the songs, there's no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about today is that there is a dark side of the moon. It's not what you think. This is one example of the dark side, and herein lie the coldest places in our solar system, and a billion year record of water in the Earth-Moon system. Okay? And <clears throat> you heard a little bit about me. Um, I just wanted to put a little more context to this. My research focuses on the surfaces and atmospheres of icy planets and moons, some of which are shown here. We use interplanetary spacecraft to explore and investigate these bodies. These are some of the missions that I have been or am currently involved with. Um, you see Cassini, the Dawn mission to Ceres and Vesta, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, a little mission called Lunar Flashlight, which we'll hear about later in the talk, and Europa Clipper, which is NASA's next flagship mission to the outer solar system. So <clears throat> you might wonder why, if my group and I are studying all these fascinating exotic worlds around the solar system, I'm going to talk about the moon, right? <laughs> the closest and boringest body in our solar system. And I'm going to try to convince you, and I hope if you take away one thing from this talk, it's that the moon is full of surprises, and they're right next door. It's so close, and that's good enough reason to go there. So I'm going to start off by putting the moon in context. So we're going to talk about the moon's place in space, and this is necessary to understand what I mean by the dark side of the moon. So here's the moon to scale with Earth. This is an actual image taken by a... Uh, Japanese spacecraft uh, from a great distance, and you can see that uh, in this view the, the scale of the moon is put in context with the scale of the Earth. So the, the moon is, is 385,000 kilometers from the Earth on average. Um, the radius of the moon is 1,737 kilometers compared to the Earth's 6,371 kilometers, so it's about a fifth the size of the Earth. Um, and this is 60 Earth radii from us, okay? So quite a distance, but not that far in the scale of the solar system. So why doesn't the moon have a dark side? So this is an animation not to scale, showing the moon orbiting the Earth. And if you look closely, it's a little hard to see in this light, but the moon is keeping the same face towards the Earth at all times. And you can see that the, the Earth's rotation rate is much faster than the Moon's orbit period. And what that means is that even though the Moon is keeping the same face towards the Earth at all times, all sides of the Moon are seeing the Sun at some point. So we've got the Moon, or the, excuse me, the Sun in the upward direction in the slide, and the Moon's uh, uh, revolution around the Earth exposes all sides to the sun at, at some time. So there is no dark side of the moon. This is showing the same thing. This is data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which I'll talk about later. So LRO has been mapping the moon since 2009, and this is actual data, image data projected onto a three-dimensional moon, um, showing how the lunar phases change 
as the moon moves around in its orbit, the names of various uh, craters and important features on the lunar surface are kind of popping in and out as the sunlight moves around the moon um, along the terminator. The uh, wobbling motion you're seeing is called libration, and that happens every month as the moon moves around in its orbit. It moves closer and further away from the Earth, and the gravity of the Earth also causes it to wobble a bit on its axis. Okay, so there's no dark side of the moon, but maybe Pink Floyd meant the far side. Uh, we've seen that too. <laughs> so this is not a hidden side of the moon anymore. This is the first image of the far side of the moon taken in 1959 by the Soviet uh, Luna 3 spacecraft. And you see some of the same features uh, in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data um, compiled starting in 2009. So this is the same view of the far side of the moon that Luna 3 saw. Um, so maybe that's what they meant was the far side. I don't know. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what do I mean by the dark side of the moon? The moon has a special orbit. And this is a bit complex, so stay with me. <clears throat> the Earth's spin axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees from its orbital plane, meaning that the direction to the sun is, uh, varies from uh, 23 and a half degrees t in one direction to 23 and a half degrees to the other, right? So in this view, we've got the spin axis pointed along the arrow. Um, this is called the ecliptic plane, the, the plane containing the sun and the earth. The moon's orbit is inclined relative to the ecliptic plane by five degrees. But the moon itself is tilted by just over six degrees from its own orbit. So what that does is it means this arrow, which indicates the spin axis of the moon, is almost oriented perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. Remember, that's the direction to the sun, okay? So that means the moon's spin axis <coughs> is oriented perpendicular to the plane containing the sun. So the sunlight is coming in horizontally at the pole, okay? So imagine yourself standing at the pole of the moon. What would the sun look like in your sky? What would its motion look like? I see some people doing this, yeah. So over the course of a month, you would see the sun revolving around your horizon like this. Now put yourself down inside a crater. Where's the sun? It's behind the walls of the, the crater, right? So that's exactly what's going on. So <clears throat> this is an animation taken from uh, real lunar topography data uh, projecting the sun's illumination onto the lunar surface at the south pole of the moon. And you can see these shadows are moving around in a circle, but there's some of them that don't go away. So this is over the course of a whole month, and some places get shadowed and then lit up by the sun again. Some places uh, are always sunlit, it seems like. Like this, the rim of this crater called Shackleton uh, retains almost permanent illumination. But then you'll notice that some of these depressions never see the sun. And in fact, we think they never see the sun in a billion years. So this is the dark side of the moon. Oh, I meant to mention that uh, the moon is not the only body in our solar system that has uh, an obliquity, we call this the obliquity of the spin axis that is so small. Uh, the moon is one and a half degrees, Mercury is even smaller at a tenth of a degree. And Ceres, the nearest dwarf planet in the main asteroid belt, uh, varies between zero and 19 degrees. It wobbles on its axis. The Galilean satellites of Jupiter, three degrees. All of these bodies have permanent shadows at their poles during some part of the year, if not the whole year. So this idea was recognized in 1961. So this group of authors from Caltech, Watson, Murray, and Brown uh, put out a paper saying, well, we realize that because the moon's spin axis is oriented perpendicular to the sun, there's going to be these craters that are in permanent shadow. They're going to be really cold. So if any volatiles, like water, managed to get there, they would be trapped for billions of years. So they said the perennial shadows at the moon's poles should be full of ice if any water 
exists in the, in the moon's uh, atmosphere or on the surface. So where would that water come from? There's a few different sources. So if we went to those permanent shadows and there were ice there that we could extract and analyze, what would we see? Um, these are the three main sources. So <clears throat> I'll start with comets and asteroids. So comets we know are icy. They're coming on these very uh, elliptical trajectories from the outer solar system inward. And they're carrying with them ice that's left over from the formation of the solar system. So this could be a, a very you know, uh, uh, concentrated supply of, of water to the moon if they happen to impact the moon. Asteroids also carry up to 10 or maybe 30 percent water um, bound up in the minerals within the asteroids. So asteroids actually could supply quite a bit of water to the moon, um, which we know is hit by uh, both comets and asteroids. Lunar volcanism. So the moon is perhaps dormant today. We don't know that for sure, but at least uh, most of the volcanism that occurred on the moon uh, occurred several billion years ago, within the first one and a half billion years after its formation. Um, but this lunar volcanism, if it's anything like volcanism on Earth, would output a lot of water and other volatiles into the lunar atmosphere. In fact, there was a paper that came out just last year talking about uh, the idea that the moon may have had a transient thick atmosphere that would be reminiscent of the Martian atmosphere um, in, its, in its thickness and even in its dynamics. Um, so that water and other volatiles that ends up in the lunar atmosphere, if these permanent shadows existed at that time, would trap some of those, uh, those molecules at the poles. So maybe that's one, another source of, of ice at the lunar poles. One that you might not think of is the solar wind. So the solar wind is uh, the stream of particles coming off the sun all the time with varying in intensity and, um, and direction, but the solar wind is predominantly protons. So these are hydrogen atoms uh, stripped of their electrons, and so um, the solar wind itself could carry effectively hydrogen to the lunar surface. And we think this may be um, in fact, the, the greatest supply of, of hydrogen atoms to the moon um, dominating over these other two sources. We'd like to know. We don't know. There's lots of questions that you could answer if you could access the ice at the lunar poles. Here's one example that I'm interested in. So we know that when the solar system formed, most of the icy material was in the outer solar system where the temperatures were lower. So inside of the frost line, which is just analogous to the frost line that you see on a, a mountain uh, after a, a fresh snowfall where you can see snow above a certain elevation and, and uh, no snow below that, um, that's exactly analogous to this line. So inside towards the sun, we don't get condensation of, of water in this case, and outside you get lots of ice. And so um, if we could sample the ice at the lunar poles, maybe we would see the degree to which that icy material has been transported into the inner solar system over the last few billion years that we think those uh, permanent shadows have existed. So that's one example of a question you could answer <coughs> if you could access these deposits. Okay, so I've explained what we think we might find. What have we found? So we've been looking. I'm going to start with mercury which might come out of nowhere, but this discovery kind of comes out of nowhere. So <clears throat> Mercury has polar ice caps. It's the hottest planet in the solar system uh, without an atmosphere, and uh, yet at its poles it's got uh, these massive ice deposits that were first detected in radar. This is the original data showing the detection. Um, this was a ground-based uh, um, Earth-based radar that uh, measured reflections off the, the poles that indicated the presence of some kind of bright radar reflector. And these ice deposits have to be relatively pure and they have to be relatively thick, so maybe hundreds of meters thick in order to produce this, this signal. Um, we know now that they sit inside of craters that are kilometers deep and that the ice, in some cases, fills maybe halfway up those, those craters. So we've got kilometers thick sheets of ice at the poles of Mercury, which 
uh, is a planet that has temperatures near the equator of 600 degrees Kelvin. So this contrast in temperature uh, in the permanent shadows is what allows Mercury to retain this ice. So this discovery was, was made um, long after uh, the, the original prediction from Watson and Murray and Brown in 1961. This discovery was made in 1992, <clears throat> but it was tantalizing for the moon uh, because this showed that their theory at least worked on Mercury. So people started looking at the moon too. It turns out the moon is actually a little bit harder to observe than Mercury for a variety of reasons having to do with the geometry of its orbit around the Earth. Um, but you can do this with a spacecraft. So the Clementine spacecraft did a radar experiment where they shined a, a signal from Earth, a radio signal from Earth, to the lunar surface, bounced it off the lunar surface to the spacecraft. And uh, the spacecraft can receive the signal. This is called a, a bi-static radar experiment. And this is the data. Um, it's not much to look at here. But what they interpreted this as uh, is this signal, this peak right here, as they went over the pole, is a peak similar to that reflection that they saw on Mercury using a similar technique. Okay, <clears throat> So there's just the first hints of, of ice at the poles of, of the moon. Um, shortly thereafter, the Lunar Prospector mission carried uh, what's called a neutron spectrometer, measuring the emission of neutrons from the lunar surface. Neutrons act like billiard balls when they encounter a hydrogen atom. Okay, so if you imagine hitting the cue ball uh, against uh, the eight ball, when it hits the eight ball, it's going to stick and stop. The eight ball shoots off, right? Uh, that's this, a, a similar phenomenon to what happens to neutrons that encounter hydrogen atoms. So when, because the neutron is a similar mass to the hydrogen atom, when it encounters a hydrogen atom, it stops or it sticks. And so what you can look for is regions of uh, a suppression in neutrons that would in indicate the presence of hydrogen. And that's what we see here. So both poles from the Lunar Prospector neutron detector showed an enhancement in the uh, amount of hydrogen. OK, so this was the first hint that Watson, Murray, and Brown's theories might be correct, and there's something worth exploring. Why do we even care? Uh, I, I mentioned some of the science value of these deposits, if they exist. <clears throat> the sources and sinks of, of water in, in the Earth-Moon system are inherently interesting because they tell us about the whole solar system. Uh, the history of outgassing of, of volatiles from the lunar interior tells us about its formation. What did, what did the moon form from? <clears throat> but then the exploration people got involved, and that's where it really got interesting, um, if you like this sort of thing. So um, there's a huge exploration uh, economic benefit if we could find water in sufficient quantity on the moon, because if you have to carry the water with you to the lunar surface for drinking water for astronauts or uh, to make rocket fuel from hydrogen and oxygen, that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars per, per uh, gallon of, of water. Those are the units we're using, I guess. Um, so if we, if, if we could bring, the, if we could, instead of bringing the water to the moon, if we could harvest it like this from the lunar surface to produce drinking water for astronauts and rocket fuel, this would save an enormous amount of, of money. And so, as you can imagine, um, the uh, uh, geophysicists got involved and, and wanted to, to know more. Um, but right around that time, this paper came out, <laughs> which throws some cold water on this whole idea. The title of the paper is No Evidence for Thick Deposits of Ice at the Lunar South Pole. <clears throat> and this is a, a study using radar data um, again, f from Earth, they waited until the geometry was just right so that the south pole of the moon was angled just so towards the Earth, towards um, Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, and they, sh they sh uh, shined the, the radar into those craters um, and did not see a signal like Clementine had seen. So now we've got the Clementine data saying one thing and the Arecibo data saying the, the exact opposite. So which is it? Shortly after that, 
there was an experiment called the Moon Mineralogy Mapper, which was a near-infrared spectrometer flying on the Indian lunar mission Chandrayaan-1. And they made a discovery which they then uh, sort of surreptitiously communicated to other researchers um, on the Cassini mission and the Deep Impact mission. These are two missions that were not intended to look at the moon, but most interplanetary spacecraft do make a flyby of the Earth-Moon system to pick up some speed to get out uh, to other planets. And they had made some flybys of the Earth-Moon system, taken some test data of the moon. And so all three teams uh, looked at their data at the same time to confirm this discovery made by uh, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper, which is that there's this absorption feature around three micrometers wavelength. And that's a very diagnostic feature of water on the lunar surface. And uh, all three investigations showed that, that basically the whole moon is wet. This, this came as a surprise because the geochemists had been arguing for years that the moon must be extremely dry. And this was more or less irrefutable, irrefutable evidence that the, the moon was, was actually uh, very um, wet instead. Okay, so this is kind of the backdrop for uh, what comes next. So at this point, we've got conflicting evidence. There's strong scientific and exploration interest in finding water on the moon in these permanent shadows. So NASA decided to kick it up a notch and launch two missions on the same rocket. Uh, the one on the left is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, I'm a co-investigator on, on this mission and I'm going to talk about a few different instruments on that spacecraft, but most importantly for my work is the Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment. This is a, a thermal infrared instrument that measures the temperatures of the moon. Okay? Um, you can't actually see it in this view. It's behind the spacecraft. The other mission launched on the same, uh, the same rocket was this one called LCROSS. Um, you can see it uh, doing its thing here. It's, it's actually um, launching this uh, upper stage of the rocket toward the moon where it's going to impact the lunar surface inside one of these permanent shadows. <clears throat> so um, before the launch, uh, I was actually a, a graduate student at the time. I came down to Florida to the Cape a week early because there was supposed to be a space shuttle launch. It was one of the last ones. And um, none of the rest of the team was there yet, including the PI of the instrument who I was working for. And he called me and said, hey, uh, I understand you're down there in, in Florida. Um, you're the only one who's, who's there, and they, they want me to go on this VIP tour of the uh, launch vehicle. <laughs> Do you want to go? And I said, uh, yeah. And so um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how I ended up. I, I, a grad student at the time, ended up in a photo at the bottom of the rocket with all the PIs of the other um, instruments. Um, anyway, it was pretty cool. We got to go up inside the um, vertical integration facility and, and see the different levels of the rocket. And if you haven't seen one of these things in real life, they're absolutely massive and, and very impressive. It's like a sci-fi movie with you know, steam coming out of tubes and all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, the objective of the LCROSS part of this is to uh, intentionally impact this upper stage of the rocket into the, uh, a permanently shadowed crater at the, the moon's south pole. Um, that's this part of the rocket right here, and uh, we all got to go up and put our hands on it, so some of my DNA might be on the surface of the moon, I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> at the same time, we were also helping to coordinate the, um, the impact uh, uh, operations, and uh, believe it or not, when they launched the the Elcross um, spacecraft, they had not picked a, a, an impact site yet. Um, and there were a variety of reasons for that, but um, anyway, they wanted to use the best data that they could get, and so we helped um, partly using, um, so I should mention that, that Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter got into orbit um, several days uh, before the Elcross impact. It was more than several days, it was a few months, I should say. And so we were able to, to get some data what you're seeing here is a model based on data from the Diviner radiometer instrument that I mentioned. So this is surface temperature of the moon's south pole. So the reds and the whites are really, really hot. 
and the blues are really, really cold. And so we used this map to help guide Elcross in choosing their impact site. We said, well, there's a variety of different really cold features. You can see them. I mean, you could look at this map and pick your favorite. There's a lot of different places that are about equally cold, right? We compared this to the neutron data that I mentioned earlier and cross-correlated them, found the spot that had lots of hydrogen and was also really cold and said, okay, this is the best spot. The LCROSS team came back and said, yeah, we like that spot, but we want to move it a little bit because um, we want to be able to observe the impact from Earth with ground-based telescopes. And so they wanted to get out of the way of, of some of these mountains that would be blocking the view from, from Earth. So we kind of settled on this, this impact site in uh, a crater called Cabeus. That's this big thing here. The, um, the, the temperature at the time of the impact in that crater was 90 degrees Kelvin. That's 90 degrees above absolute zero. So extremely cold. Um, actually, I, I misspoke. The temperature at the, at the time of impact was 40 degrees Kelvin. The maximum temperature throughout the year was 90 Kelvin. OK. We also rephased the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter orbit to come past the impact site of LCROSS at the same time that LCROSS was impacting. So we arrived on the scene um, about four minutes after the impact. So meanwhile, there's a shepherding spacecraft from LCROSS that also impacted. We come by, and this is div actual diviner data sweeping out a swath. So this is temperature across the impact site. We tried this. We did a practice run uh, the day before. And I mentioned I was a student at the time. They trusted me and another guy to, <laughs> to do the uh, calculations for um, pointing the instrument at the right spot. Um, my advisor said, you guys might want to do a practice run the day before. And I said, ah, no, we got it. We got it. We're fine. <laughs> uh, but we did a practice run the day before. And of course, we had a sign error. And we got the data down, and we were pointed the wrong direction. Um, and, and we had like literally a couple of hours to fix the mistake and upload the new uh, scan tables for the instrument to be able to do this. So when we got these data down, we were ecstatic. <laughs> so. Um, so you can't quite see it on this, this screen, but this is the same temperature data I showed a minute ago. There's a little tiny pinprick of light right at the impact site. So we, we nailed the, the impact site. Not only that, but we got a temperature of the glowing hot crater that this uh, upper stage Centaur uh, rocket made. Um, so the experiment itself was designed to uh, create an impact crater going down several meters in the subsurface and throw material up into the sunlight. So there's sunlight. Remember, we're, we're close to the poles. So the sunlight is coming in horizontally. And the idea is you want to get that stuff up into the sunlight where it can be uh, um, exposed to the light. And you can measure the reflected signal off of the ejecta from the crater uh, to see if there's any ice in it. So that's what they were doing. So using that technique, they were able to determine um, about f 5 to 7 percent of ice in that regolith. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we think that the upper surface was actually dry, maybe down to a meter or so. Um, and that most of that ice actually came from a much more concentrated layer beneath that. So there might be you know, tens of percent of, of ice below that layer. Um, the models that we came up with um, in advance of, of this impact based on the temperatures we had measured predicted other very interesting molecules that might be delivered from all those sources I mentioned before, um, including comets, uh, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, uh, uh, sulfate, uh, ammonia, and uh, methanol were all predicted. We also saw some things that we didn't expect because the temperatures were, were too high uh, to predict uh, methane and molecular uh, hydrogen. So both of these things were observed in the LCROSS impact plume. And we still don't quite understand why, how those things got there. OK. Um, so that's a, a segue into the only e equation I'm going to show in, in this entire talk. <clears throat> so what actually controls the stability of these volatile compounds on the surface of a, a, a planet or a moon. Um, well, 
<clears throat> the evaporation rate or the sublimation rate of that compound is determined by the temperature. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. So this is temperature on the bottom axis. This is the uh, evaporation rate of that molecule uh, as a function of temperature. And you can see this is a, a logarithmic scale. So if you look at the numbers here, we're going from 0 0.01 meters in a billion years. So you can imagine the deposit slowly evaporating. So down here, this is less than a one hundredth of a meter in a billion years, <clears throat> up to a thousand meters in the same amount of time. Okay, so this is a huge range of, of uh, evaporation rates. And what you notice is that these lines are nearly vertical. And what that means is that you can identify a threshold. And if you are on the left side of that threshold, a temperature colder than that, that value, then the stuff is totally inert. It's not going anywhere. It's like a rock on the surface. If you're above that line, then the stuff is going to go away very fast. Okay, so we sort of define this cutoff temperature where ice is stable below that temperature and not stable above it. And we can do that because of Clausius Clapeyron, basically. Um, and for water ice, it's uh, 110 Kelvin. So with the diviner instrument, we can map out the entire moon and figure out where this ice would be stable. So this is actual data uh, from Diviner showing the annual maximum temperatures. This is the highest temperature that the South Pole uh, reaches throughout the entire year. And what we found were the coldest places in the solar system. So this is actually significantly colder than Pluto um, because Pluto has a, a strong tilt to its spin axis, so it doesn't have permanent shadows like this. Um, the, coldest temperatures on Pluto are something around 40 Kelvin, maybe a bit colder, but um, we're seeing on the moon um, less than 25 degrees above absolute zero. And in fact, <clears throat> just kind of a side note, at these temperatures, we're getting so cold that the temperature that you're seeing is actually reflecting the interior heat flow of the moon. So you're actually seeing the, the glow of the lunar interior at these temperatures. Even though it's a very, very faint glow, you're seeing the glow of the lunar interior, which is kind of cool. So we're doing geophysics from orbit. Oh, and, and I wanted to say um, there's also more than 20,000 square kilometers of real estate where uh, water ice is stable. <clears throat> so one question that immediately comes up uh, from the LCROSS experiment is the fact that it's not a controlled experiment, right? So we, we impacted one spot, we got a positive result, but we don't have an experimental control. What if we impacted somewhere else? Would we get the same answer? So we started looking at that to see how representative is the LCROSS impact site to the rest of the moon. Um, so this is the distribution of, of areas where we think ice could be stable. The LCROSS impact site is this arrow. And this is the neutron um, hydrogen map that I, I mentioned before. Um, and you can see the Elkross site, you know, it was picked because it was a really good place to look for ice. So we're not totally sure that this is the, you know, a, a typical result for the whole South Pole. So we started looking at other data. Um, I looked at some ultraviolet data from the LAMP instrument, also on LRO. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the result. I won't go into details, but the, the map is showing um, in the grays and blacks in the background, that's temperature from Diviner. And then on the front, these blue dots are locations where we've identified surface frost based on these UV spectra. So you can see that the surface frost coincides very nicely with these coldest places. Oh, and we find um, about 1 to 10% to of, of water um, in the most concentrated places. But you see there's this significant patchiness, which is kind of strange. We don't quite understand the patchiness. If you compare that to the neutrons, so this is the neutron data is telling us again where the hydrogen is. <clears throat> you can start looking back and forth between this surface frost map and the hydrogen map. Now the hydrogen is a measurement of about an upper meter or so. So this, this could be distributed anywhere vertically in the upper meter, whereas this is just the very, very uppermost surface. So maybe it's not too surprising that we see this, these discrepancies where the neutron data is saying there's lots of hydrogen here, but there's no frost showing up here. 
Um, I'm going to skip that. So <clears throat> we have been able to address some of these discrepancies with recent work. I'm going to show just a few of those here. So um, one very uh, surprising and, and exciting thing was that an instrument that was not designed in any way to look for ice on the moon found ice on the moon. So uh, this was the laser altimeter instrument. It's called LOLA on LRO. It's similar to instruments that have flown to, to Mars and Mercury. Um, and uh, what you can do with, with LOLA, with the altimeter, is to look at not only the elevation of the surface where you get the reflection from, but how strong is that reflection? How intense was the, the backscatter from that, that surface? And that backscatter from the surface should be stronger if there's frost, right? We all know that frost is bright and the moon is relatively dark. So if you compare those two different kinds of materials, you should see a bright reflection where there's ice. And that's exactly what they saw. So here's an example of, of a crater that has a, a permanent shadow in it. That's the blue thing on the left. And inside that blue thing, you see this nice bright reflection from the surface frost. We took this to the next level with um, <clears throat> some data from the uh, same moon mineralogy mapper I mentioned before. So uh, this is a uh, hyperspectral imager, meaning it's measuring reflecting, reflected sunlight in many different wavelengths. <clears throat> so if it's measuring reflected sunlight, how is it going to get a signal in the permanent shadows? I've said over and over again, there's no sunlight there, right? Well, what we did was we used the scattered sunlight. So again, imagine yourself down in the, the crater. You've got the crater walls around you. The sun's never rising above the crater walls, but there is some sunlight that's reflecting off of the crater walls. So you, if you looked up, you would see sunlit walls all around you, or at least on one side of you. That sunlight is being reflected down into the crater, into the shadows, and we use that reflected sunlight to get a signal. It's a ratty signal. It's not very good, but we, we were able to use many, many spectra uh, to get these detections. And when you look at the, the uh, spectrum of, of these things, um, if you're a spectroscopist and I showed them to you, you would immediately say that's, that's ice. Um, ice has a very, water ice has very distinctive diagnostic uh, features in it. And so we found the, the fingerprint of, of water ice in these craters. And when you compare those to the, the earlier detections from the other instruments, we see a good correlation between uh, the, the, the two or the three. Um, for some reason, the lunar south pole has more ice than the north. And if anyone has any idea why that would be, let me know. Uh, <clears throat> another sort of a side note, but an interesting thing is um, this hypothesis that, that came out in, in Nature um, a, f a few, uh, I guess, two, two years ago now, um, where uh, Matt Siegler and colleagues uh, suggested that they're seeing in the hydrogen signal evidence for an ancient deposit of ice that could have been deposited there billions of years ago. And the way they did that was they showed that the uh, centroid or the, the concentration of, of the hydrogen is not at the pole where we'd expect it today, but it's offset from the pole. And this is true at both poles in a consistent direction. So what they said was this was the pole at some time in the past. And in fact, the moon has undergone what's called polar wander, meaning it's reoriented itself uh, relative to uh, the, the spin axis is reoriented relative to the surface. And they did some modeling to show that if you did the same kind of um, thermal maps that I've been showing for the present day moon, but then went back a billion years to this, uh, before this polar wander event, you would get a distribution of, of um, permanent shadows that look something like this. So they lined those up and they said this is evidence that the moon actually has undergone polar wander in the last billion years. If that's true, there could be much thicker ice deposits down there that we have not detected yet using existing techniques. I should mention that um, that controversy with the radar uh, detection and non-detection still exists, but we think that the radar signal is not penetrating deeply enough uh, from Earth because from Earth you're looking at a glancing angle, right? And so that reflection is going through a very shallow layer and the ice is actually deeper than that. There's some new evidence that I'm not going to show 
um, because it's too new, that um, a lot of these polar craters at the moon are, uh, are filled with, with ancient ice. The uh, depth to diameter ratios are much too shallow uh, relative to the rest of the moon, so we think they might, might be full of ice. So what are we going to do in the future going forward to, to take advantage of, of this potential scientific treasure trove? Um, well, the politicians got involved uh, and, and told us what we're going to do. So this is the President's Space Policy Directive um, number one. I don't know what number two is going to be, but uh, it's to lead an innovative and uh, sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners. So uh, commercial is a key word that hasn't really been used much before um, in this context. <clears throat> to enable human expansion across the solar system and bring back to Earth new knowledge, great, and opportunities. Uh, beginning with missions beyond low Earth orbit uh, will lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration and utilization. That means resources, uh, followed by human missions to Mars and, and other destinations. So whether or not you like the uh, motivation for doing this, um, this is the direction that has been given to NASA. Um, and this has been given before, but I just wanted to point out one difference this time around, and that's that there's money behind it. And so, <clears throat> as you may know or not know, the NASA budget is actually very healthy right now, um, and a significant fraction of the, the, the planetary science budget is being is, is a new uh, program uh, dedicated to uh, going to the moon. So <clears throat> this kind of, of chart shows up you know, every four years, <laughs> and and you'll see either the moon or Mars is big, right? You know, and, and depending on what what the administration's priorities are. So right now the moon is in, you know, and and um, I would be skeptical or cynical if it weren't for this money that's being injected into it. Um, okay, so that's enough about that. Um, some of the features of this new lunar program. Um, okay, so there's this new big rocket called Space Launch System, SLS. Um, whether or not that actually goes, I don't know, um, but that's a key component to the, the human part of this. Uh, but luckily for us, this thing is big enough that they put on lots of other uh, stuff that, you know, without much impact to the, the main mission. And so we've been able to stick on a CubeSat on the first launch of this uh, vehicle, which I'll talk about in a minute, that's going to go to the moon. Um, we snuck that on there. Uh, there's also the uh, Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway with the not-so-charismatic acronym LOPG. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be sort of a space station in lunar orbit. Not super useful for science, in my opinion, but um, nonetheless, it'll provide some, uh, you know, relatively permanent presence at the moon, which inevitably will lead to, to more science. Um, the commercial partnerships are uh, being highlighted intensively, and also the international uh, partnerships. You may have seen this press release today that uh, NASA and the Israeli Space Agency just signed an agreement to put an instrument uh, from NASA on uh, the first lunar lander from uh, the Israeli Space Agency. This is the uh, NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstein, and the uh, Associate Administrator for Science, uh, Thomas Zerbukin, on the right. Excuse me. Okay. Um, so just to highlight uh, one piece of my involvement in this, so uh, Lunar Flashlight is a, a CubeSat um, it's not actually a cube, but it, it fits within this CubeSat paradigm. So it's, it's a, for those who know what this means, it's a 6U CubeSat. That means it's about the size of a big uh, cereal box. <clears throat> and there's a long history to this thing that I don't have time to get into, but we uh, ultimately settled on using lasers. Um, <laughs> and it's always cool when you get to use lasers, right? So um, what we're doing is we're, we're shining lasers into these permanently shadowed craters at the moon's poles and measuring the reflected signal from the surface. And we're doing this at multiple different laser wavelengths. I mentioned that water ice has a very nice set of diagnostic absorption features. We can use those looking in the right laser wavelengths, measuring the reflected signal uh, to detect water ice. So <clears throat> that's why it's called lunar flashlight, is to be able to see into these 
shadows for the, the first time uh, in this way. Um, so that's supposed to launch uh, in 2019, which is s scarily close. I, I'm not so sure about that, but um, we'll, we'll launch when we, when we can. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was that uh, you know, the, the, the future um, is bright for Colorado and uh, Boulder and, and LASP in particular in terms of involvement in this new lunar program and exploring the permanent shadows of the moon. Um, one uh, example of that, which is ongoing, is involvement in, in the Solar System Exploration uh, Virtual Institute, Research Virtual Institute, SERVI. Um, you can see the map of the United States where uh, the stars are involvement in, in that institute. Uh, we have three separate PI-led nodes um, in Boulder with two at this university. So there's heavy involvement in this kind of research, which is to advance understanding of, of these kinds of bodies for future exploration. Um, so I, I guess the thing I want to leave you with is that the moon may be close by and, and well studied, but there's still plenty of surprises uh, that, that continue to, um, to um, entice us. <clears throat> we can use the moon to test theories of, of ranging from planet formation to the dynamics of the solar system. I mentioned a few of these things, volatile behavior and transport. And if you're interested in exploration of deep space by humans, the moon must be a stop on the way. It's going to be a proving ground for uh, both the technologies and the scientific techniques that we'll take elsewhere. Uh, and I, I want to highlight the moon's polar regions as its most exciting and unique features, uh, in my opinion, as someone who studies ice. So uh, thank you very much, and just to acknowledge my uh, various funding sources and co-authors. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Uh, do we have new technology to study the rocks that we got from Apollo missions? Yes, absolutely. And um, if my wife were here, she could tell you all about that. She is a geochemist, cosmochemist who studies Apollo samples that were brought back um, during that time using techniques that have only been developed in the last few years. So. Um, you know, we're developing new analytical capabilities for these samples that didn't exist in 1970 um, and you know, didn't even exist 10 years ago and learning all kinds of new things about the you know, history um, of the solar system. Yeah. yeah, in the back. I'm a curious about uh, the creation of craters at the polar regions. Uh, since most of the things in the solar system fly around in the same plane, how, how do the polar regions yeah, good question. So um, the it's it's true. There's a slight enhancement of impactors or, or asteroids and uh, other potential impactors in the equatorial plane in the ecliptic, but it's not as high as you would think. A lot of these smaller bodies do have higher orbital inclinations, and when they get close to the Earth and hit the Moon they've been deflected usually, right? So the, the gravity of the Earth uh, being much stronger than the Moon's uh, will uh, act as a lens that deflects the, the impactors. Um, so we, we don't get a perfectly isotropic distribution of impactors, but it's, um, it's relatively uniform over the, the whole Moon. And um, we can prove this based on the distribution of different sizes of craters on the Moon. Um, up front first. Well, as we near to revisit to the moon, and you're looking at these potential resources, uh, it appears that there will eventually be a geopolitical component that arises about who owns the water, who has mineral rights, and so forth and so on, that kind of reflect the world we live in out here in the Old West. And I wonder who, who is contemplating that, if anybody, in the scientific community, because it can put a clamp on what we effectively can do. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't know a whole lot about that, um, I'll admit. 
uh, but people are talking about it. Um, motivated both by NASA's plans and also other nations. So I didn't mention, I should have mentioned, and I'm, um, I've, I've neglected to mention the, the Chinese who have a, um, a very active lunar program now. They've, they've landed multiple different large lunar landers, um, one with a rover, uh, which took some beautiful images from the lunar surface. This lander they have is, is well big enough to carry humans. Um, so we, we will probably see Chinese astronauts on the surface, um, you know, at least as early as, as we see American astronauts. So the question is, yeah, um, who owns the, the resources? Um, technically, no one does because of the, um, I think it's the, the Space Act uh, Treaty, which says that you know, these, these uh, astronomical bodies are, are not owned by, by anyone. But if you start using the resources, then you've gained some economic uh, value to that, right? And so at that point, um, you've declared ownership. So I, I don't know. I, I don't have a strong opinion about it. Personally, I don't think we should you know, be um, fighting about it. I think we should be cooperating. With respect to origin of water, you mentioned at the beginning things like asteroids, which I thought was the, the dominant factor, but also comets, or it was informed within the moon when the moon was formed, or from um, you know the solar wind. So, what's the current status of that research in determining what the ratio of the various mechanisms is. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I sort of glossed over it, but in, in the l -Cross impact uh, plume, we detected water and, and that assortment of other compounds. And those were largely consistent with comets, a cometary source. The ratios of those things, water to uh, methanol or, or water to carbon dioxide, didn't exactly match what we think comets are made of, <clears throat> although we've now seen with um, Rosetta and other missions that comets might be more diverse than we thought. Um, there was more sulfur and sulfur-bearing compounds in the uh, source region than um, would have occurred uh, from comets alone. And that has been argued as a, um, a reason to think that that some of that material may have come from lunar outgassing from volcanoes. So none of those things um, can be produced by the solar wind by itself. So we know that comets and probably lunar interior outgassing must supply some of that uh, volatile material, but we can't rule out the solar wind as a source. Um, I would say the current thinking actually is that the solar wind is not efficient on the moon in producing water, but it is on Mercury. And that has to do with the temperature difference at the sunlit surfaces of the, the bodies, that you need, you sort of need an, an activation energy to get over a threshold to produce water with uh, solar wind protons. Is you, any of your instrumentation, can it look at uh, deuterium hydrogen ratios? Because that I understood was one of the reasons why they thought asteroids might be a higher percentage because the deuterium hydrogen ratio matches asteroids, whereas comets they thought they found were typically a much higher ratio. Yeah, so that's that's the area where it looks like that deuterium to hydrogen ratio among the comets is more diverse than we thought. And so with some combination of comets, you could get the same ratios as, as Earth's oceans, more or less. Um, <clears throat> For the moon, no, none of our current instrumentation can measure that D to H ratio, but I've got an instrument proposal that we're planning to submit to NASA to, to do that. Seems like the uh, retrieval of the water would be a big engineering problem. Have you thought about that? Uh, how, uh, how soluble those engineering problems would be? Yeah, so the, the two things that you have to contend with are um, temperature and concentration. So if it's really only a few weight percent of water, then you've got to sift through a lot of regolith to get enough water to be useful. Um, the temperature problem um, only 
exists if uh, you have no way of, of heating your uh, harvester when it's inside the permanent shadow. Um, one proposed approach is to sit up on the crater rim where you're in almost permanent sunlight and shine light down, reflect, reflect sunlight with the giant mirror down onto your harvester. Um, then you could either use the heat from that sunlight or uh, to, to evaporate or sublimate the, the ice, um, or you could use that to, to power the, the, um, the system. Our colleagues down at uh, School of Mines are thinking very intensively about this. Uh, I th actually, I think you were next. Uh, so if there's water, um, I, mean, I think you mentioned maybe perhaps an atmosphere in the past. Any chance that there is or was life? No. It's <laughs> the short answer. Uh, the atmosphere would have been too short-lived to support life, uh, either its emergence or its persistence. We're talking um, the paper that, that I mentioned that, that discussed this uh, temporary atmosphere talked about lifetimes of um, 10 million years or so for the atmosphere, which sounds like a long time. Um, but I did some calculations that showed it shouldn't last that long, and uh, another one of my colleagues found the same thing. So I think it's much uh, shorter lives than that, maybe a few hundred thousand years. The water on the moon now is, of course, all ice or uh, little molecules stuck to, to grains. Yeah. Would you like two more? Sure. Does the accumulation of volatiles change the shape of the craters in a way that you could see? Yes. Uh, well, I, I think so. So I mentioned some very recent results uh, from some folks at UCLA. Um, looking at the shape of the, the craters and <clears throat> looking at the difference in the shapes of the polar craters compared to the uh, equatorial craters. And you do see a difference. They're shallower at the poles, um, which indicates the presence of maybe hundreds of meters of, of ice deposits within those craters. This is very new stuff that has not been through peer review, but, <laughs> but I, I, I've seen the, the data and it looks pretty good. One more? Fran. <laughs> so what's your reaction to my claim that there's nothing that humans can do in space that robots can't do cheaper and better and faster than, except tourism? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think, yeah, I mean, m my initial reaction is you're right, but I think you, you can look at it in, in two different ways, at least. Um, if you take money out of the equation, then I think you're wrong, actually. If you put money in the equation, then you're right. So let me explain what I mean by that. If, <clears throat> if you're just looking at a human mission versus a robotic mission, um, the Apollo missions disproved your uh, theory because um, the amount of, of science that was done by the Apollo astronauts, especially in Apollo 17 when we had a real geologist on the surface looking for things that were interesting, um, was far more than what we would get from one yeah, mission. I'm not sure. I, 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 I'd like to be proven wrong because it's a more efficient way to do it, but uh, in terms of cost, and so that brings me to the other uh, way of looking at it, which is if you in invested the hundreds of billions of dollars that we spent on Apollo uh, in robotic missions, then yeah, of course, we'd, we'd, we'd have you know, crawling robots all over the moon and Mars and Europa and you know, <laughs> everything else, balloons and Jupiter. You know, so um, yeah, I, I think when you look at it that way, then, of course, it's more cost effective to, to spend the money on robots. NASA will never do that because the, the public doesn't want that. So, and, and I, I just, I wish, I, I wish that weren't the case, but I think it is.